through Marshstream, your solo performance broadcasting platform. I'm Kristen Scheel for The Marsh, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for Solo Arts Heal with your host, Gail Shigley. The Marsh brings you free performances nearly every night of the week. We hope you will support our artists and live theater by contributing to our Marsh tip jar, which will be linked to the chat throughout the evening. And we hope you'll check out our growing library of archive performances on our website at themarsh.org and on our YouTube channel, The Marsh Stream. And without th further ado, um, I'm introducing you to Gail and uh, take it away. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kristen. Thanks so much. There's always so much great stuff on the Marsh Stream platform. And um, we're really grateful that you offer this diverse public performance platform for the benefit of communities everywhere. Tonight, we present Solo Art Seal Climate Edition featuring citizen Deb Castellano in Waste Management, the show in which a woman with way too much on her plate gives herself 49 days to save the earth and which inspired the popular blog in which Deb continues to try to save the world or at least get people to use less plastic. But before we get into the wonderful world of Citizen Deb, let me tell you uh, for a moment about Solo Arts Heal. Just a year ago, we began a collective of solo artists whose shows embody the healing power of the arts through terrific storytelling as survivors and caregivers across a variety of physical and mental challenges. And when COVID began, we were invited by artist group member, Marsh Artistic Director Stephanie Wiseman, to tell these stories live as Solo Arts Heal on the new Marsh Stream platform. We'd been looking for our audience and we found you, learning that our audience isn't only in medical centers and health and wellness clinics, our audience is every community because we all face mental and physical challenges. We all need resources and what better way than through great performance. Solo Arts Heal presents performance and informance on a broad variety of health and wellness related issues, including environmental and social justice challenges as we all work together to create a country and a world that honors all people and our mother earth. So tonight, on Solo Arts Heal, our special guest is Citizen Deb Castellano. Let me tell you about her. Deb wrote and performed a 25 minute version of Waste Management, the show in New York City in the pre-Trump days, if anyone remembers those. Tonight, she'll be reading excerpts for us with some updates. And if we have time, a sneak preview from her upcoming book on how to save the planet, or should we? Deb's past writing credits include television and live sketch comedy in LA, solo shows in New York City, print ads, radio spots, and neon signs. Half of a country song, I think. And she once recommended a book to Bono, which he then purchased. <laughs> and her blog, Citizen Deb, is fabulous. So now, please join me in welcoming Deborah Castellano and excerpts from Waste Management, the show. Hello. Let me just move this out of the way. Did you know that every time you Google something, it uses energy? There's a server somewhere that's powered by something. I don't really know the details, but there's some big building in a desert or someplace. And every time you type like cute cat videos or why does my foot hurt or is democracy dead? It requires energy. And the reason that I mention this is that I've heard that at the end of our lives, we should ask ourselves three questions. Did I live, did I love, and did I matter? Which is probably a load of bull pucky, but it did get me thinking. I've lived. In evolutionary terms, I'm like basically a big loser, which I'll explain later, but I've, I've tangoed in Buenos Aires badly, but still. Uh, I've eaten street food in Vietnam. I've sailed along the coast of Spain, danced on tabletops in South Beach, been spontaneously photographed by Bill Cunningham in New York City. I mean, right? He didn't publish it. I tried to have a baby on my own. That didn't work out. I got, got through breast cancer. That did work out. Um, I still haven't gotten to wear that damn wedding dress. I mean, okay, sue me. I want to wear that freaking dress and share my life with a sweet someone. But have I loved? Absolutely. My parents and a brother and aunts and uncles and cousins and an adorable little nephew. 
And trust me, when I say I am in love with my friends, they are the bomb. But will I be able to say I mattered? Because as I see it now, I'm kind of just taking up space on this planet, which by the way, we're outgrowing. According to what I'm reading, we're going through our resources so fast that in about 20 years, we're gonna need two Earths to support us. And we only have one. So how can I help? Whenever people ask me that annoying question, what are you passionate about? I go, I don't know, recycling. <laughs> I don't know why. When I was a kid, it was animals. My, my best friend, Jenny, and I would ride around our suburban neighborhood on our bikes, pretending they were horses and feeding all the imaginary lions and tigers. She was Jenny of the jungle and I was Debbie of the desert. And then I guess horses begat polar bears and polar bears begat global warming. And now I recycle everything I can get my hands on, metal, paper, plastic, but only the plastic on the city's collection list. I have eschewed saran wrap and aluminum foil in favor of Tupperware. For a good couple of years, I carried my kitchen scraps through the streets of New York City to the composting guy at the farmer's market. I even keep a reusable spork in my purse. I don't know. And yet despite all that, in reality, I am this total dilettante. I work in advertising. I help sell soda in plastic bottles and tampons with pla plastic applicators. I basically am the bad guy. Can I tell you how many things I have plugged in at home right now? Um, stereo, speakers, cable modem, uh, numerous lamps, refrigerator, stove, microwave oven, uh, washer dryer, a coffee grinder, um, the little magnified mirror on the bathroom counter with a light in it, which is really cool, but also horrifying at the same time. Two laptop computers, whatever iPhone or iPad is currently charging, plus the occasional food processor, curling iron, or Nutribullet because I need my kale protein smoothie. I don't have a television. whoop de doo I have Netflix, YouTube, and my parents' cable news password. Such a hypocrite. Did you know Americans generate 30% of the world's trash, but we're only like 5% of the population? But what do we do? Go back to the third world? It's not gonna happen. Should I turn out the lights in the living room when I go into the bedroom? What if I'm not gonna be in here that long? Turn them back on? That's weird, right? Or I could change the bulbs to LED ones, but they're so unflattering. Plus, I've heard that those little things don't matter much anyway, that it's at much higher levels that things have to change. There's gotta be something I can do. I mean, there's an entire country in the Indian Ocean that's gonna be underwater in 10 years, like Atlantis. I've actually been there. And ironically, the scuba diving was incredible. Gorgeous reef. But that doesn't mean we should make its people live under there. Okay, so this is what I decided to do. Being a smart person with advantages and resources and contacts, I resolved to pull all that together and do something really big and important. Create a show about it. So I signed up for a seven week solo show workshop. That's 49 days. And by the end of those 49 days, I'd find a way to make a difference. And I was gonna start with the frackers. Here's how that went. Day one. So I've read the Wikipedia entry and here's what it says. Hydraulic fracturing or hydrofracking is a means of petroleum extraction by way of propagation of fractures in a rock layer as a result of the action of a pressurized fluid. I don't think I can fight something I don't really get. Okay, I know what I'm gonna do. I wanna follow a plastic bottle through the recycling system and see what happens to it. After my cleaning lady takes it to the basement of my luxury condominium. Tomorrow I'll call my friend Jessie. Her sister supposedly knows about recycling. End of excerpt one. That's, that's fabulous, Deb, Citizen Deb. Um, I love it. And uh, you. you have an introduction to a lot of ideas here, but plastic is, um, 
is where we're headed. What a brilliant idea to follow a plastic bottle through the waste stream. Yeah, it was a simple thing that you thought would be easy, but it's actually not easy to find those things out. Yes. Um, well, we'll learn more about it. We talked um, a little before the show, and if I may, um, just about some of the um, figures that we're looking at, because, you know, since we started producing um, plastic in 1950, the world produced about 2 million tons a year, and now we're up to over three, maybe 380 million tons a year. And I think in the period from 1950 to 2015, the cumulative production reached 7.8 billion tons of plastic. So more than a ton of person for every person alive on the planet today. And it's cumulative because, you know, it, it's not that it goes away every year. It, it, it keeps adding more and more. It, it's just, I know. Fun. And, and production is supposed to triple, I think by 2050 is one report I read. It's crazy. I mean, I don't, I literally don't have any idea what those numbers mean. You know what I mean? Like, what does that even mean? Like billions of pounds. I mean, I, it's funny because I'm always trying to find a way to communicate with people. Like, I feel like I'm a communicator. That's my job to, to show people like how to change their behavior and, and how to have a positive impact on people, like how to touch them and make, you know, inspire them. And so like, for example, though, I was at my mom's um, over the holidays and, um, you know, I opened her fridge and there was all this, she's going to kill me. She's watching right now. Hi mom. Um, but you know, there were just all these things with like saran wraps or little sh shower caps or whatever over it. And, and I was like, yeah. you know, I, 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 your daughter's an environmentalist. Like how can you, you know, <laughs> What, what, what am I not communicating? Like, it's my, it's my issue. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm just thinking like, if, if I, if I can't reach my mom, like what am I doing wrong? Um, so yeah. So I'm like trying to take those numbers that are so scary and so untouchable and kind of make them human. Yeah. You know, and it's hard to avoid. I mean, you know, your mother and, and me, because um, it, when you go to the supermarket, it, things are encased in plastic and. Um, oh yeah. You know, I know packaging is by far the biggest um, use of, of uh, you know, among, among the different. Right, things. right. I call, but I call, Sometimes I, we can't avoid it, but we can avo we have some power there as consumers, don't we? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, somewhat. I mean, first of all, my definition of packaging is the stuff that other stuff comes in. It's like, it's just there temporarily, but yeah, I mean, we, it's tricky to find out what our, what our power is because, you know, I say, I talk in my book about how, you know, it's really been a scam by the plastic producers to make the consumer think that it's our fault. And if that we just recycle, then everything's fine. Right. Um, buy more plastic. And, it's, and food it's grade really plastic, I think. The food grade plastic isn't isn't um, recyclable, is it? The food grade plastic, plastic, meaning plastic bags. No, like the black plastic that you buy a chicken in, or you know something that you know some oh, foods. Oh, um, I don't there's, think. There's uh, very little that's recyclable, and even less that's recycled. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's like. Oh, I had the I had the uh, the number up here a few minutes ago, like. The, the amount of plastic that in the whole, where is it? Um, in the whole ever that's been actually recycled is um, in the last, yeah, since, since machine recycling became a thing like 40 years ago, less than 10% of all the plastic that's ever been manufactured has actually been recycled. Oh, that is really disturbing. And, yeah. you know, we, we pride ourselves on waste management in this country. Um, and, and yet we are um, really the people that produce the most waste. We are. Pointed out yeah. there. Although there are some countries yeah. that need to improve greatly in, in Asia and um, in, in, in the Pacific. But um, well, they're taking a lot of that plastic is our plastic, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, they're taking, well, they were until they said, sorry, we're not going to do that anymore. Right, right. Yeah. Get rid of your own your laws. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it takes up, um, I think, you know, six or 8% of global oil consumption is taking up to in making uh, plastic every year. Uh, and if it's going to, yeah. it's going to triple, yikes, we're headed in the wrong I know. Way. I know. We have to really support the plastic companies and trying to come up with some stuff that, 
when I say support, I mean force and scream and yell and complain to the plastic companies that they need to really come up with some new technologies that are more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And we could start at our local markets and tell them that we care. You know, tell the management of the supermarket where you where you shop that you know you want to see less plastic. It's just a real concern. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, at least the plastic bag has been banned in New York, which is great, and California for a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So stores are doing what they can. So as you said, it kind of has to happen from both grassroots as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, down. I think our job is to put the pressure. I think you know it has to change happens from the bottom and the top, right? We have to put the pressure from the bottom when, and so then the top, the government is forced to make a change. Like, look at what happened today. It's been, a, you know, some, something happened today. I'm not sure if everybody knows about it, but you know, it's a lot of pressure from here and then those in charge have to respond. So yeah, both yeah. ends. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know you have another excerpt if you'd like to, um, I don't, I'm not sure how to set that up. Is that something you could do? Um, yeah, this is just, uh, then I'm moving forward in my timeline of my 49 days to save the world. And um, I'm now on day seven. See you soon. Okay. Day seven. I'm at one of my freelance jobs. This is when we used to go to jobs and have jobs. Anyway, there's a woman here who cleans the bathrooms, or maybe I should say she maintains the bathrooms. I think basically her job is to make sure that the toilet papers and paper towels are in the dispensers. She's a young Latina woman from the Dominican Republic. She wears a white dress that looks a little bit like a nurse's uniform. She speaks English with an accent. Her name is Marisol. There are seven stalls in the ladies room on the second floor here. Each stall holds two rolls of toilet paper. There are 12 floors in the building. And twice a day, Marisol goes into these ladies' rooms, removes any rolls of toilet paper that are more than half used, and replaces them with new rolls. And what does she do with these half used rolls? She throws them away. Times seven stalls, times 12 floors. Sometimes she uses one of the half used rolls as a sponge to quickly wipe up water from around the designer sinks. And then she tosses it with the others into the big black garbage bag that she has to drag around. I don't know what goes on in the men's room, but I will say this. In the years that I've been working here, I have never seen even one of these stalls with one of its two dispensers empty, much less both dispensers. Today, I decided to talk to her about it. Hey, Marisol, um, do you think you could maybe wait until more of the toilet paper is used before you change the roll? Oh, my boss, he says to change it. Um, well, yeah, but you're in here twice a day, right? So maybe you could wait till more of it gets used. And she smiled nice. But inside, she was probably like, listen, white lady, I got kids to feed and I'm in here cleaning your freaking toilets for minimum wage. So why don't you go talk to somebody else about whatever you're talking about? Because I'm busy. I mean, maybe it was in Spanish inside her head, but I'm sure it was something like that. So then, even though I'm only a freelancer at this place, I went into my department supervisor's office to see if maybe she could go up the chain of command. Yeah, Deb, we outsource that company. There's nothing we can do about it. Oh, okay. So just because we pay them to work for us, we can't tell them what we want? Let's do the math. Let's say Marisol tosses out five half rolls of toilet paper a day. And that's a very conservative estimate. Times 12 floors, five days a week, 50 weeks a year. That's 15,000 half rolls of toilet paper per year, just in the ladies room of one company. By the way, you can't recycle unused toilet paper. You can only use it. Day 22, I don't care about the environment. In fact, I don't really care about anything right now because we're all busy. I need to fix a clog in the bathroom sink, work two of my four freelance jobs, buy an avocado, don't ask. I've emailed my friend Jesse so I can ask her sister about recycling. After my second email to Jesse, she answered me. 
Hi, Deb, so sorry, I'm overbooked, but I really want to help. And God bless her, she followed up a few days later with an email to her sister that I'm CC'd on. Then I emailed Jesse's sister and CC Jesse. Jesse just replied back to me that her sister's three-year-old started school today, so she's probably had a hectic day, but she, Jesse, will call her sister tonight. Is this how Deep Throat was with Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward? Were they all just like, damn, I'd really like to break this Watergate thing, but I've got a load of laundry in and a gynecologist appointment and house guests coming. It's just crazy right now. You know what? I met a guy a few years ago somewhere, I don't know, who worked for the city, I think in the recycling division. Is it possible that I still have his card? I dig deep into the nether regions of my desk. <laughs> And I find it. His name is Ian Twine. And the number can't possibly still be good, but I call it. Sanitation Bureau composting unit. Is this Ian Twine? Ian's out for three weeks on a project. Who's calling? Well, um, my name's Deb and I met Ian socially a few years ago. Um, I'm a writer, but I'm not a journalist. I'm writing a theatrical piece called Waste Management, the show. And as part of my show, I wanna follow a plastic bottle through the recycling system. You know, find out what happens to it, what's being recycled and what's not, what's happening to the things that aren't, stuff like that. Oh, you have to talk to Pub Ed about that. Pub Ed, um, public education? Yeah, I'll give you the number. Okay. And you're working with composting? That's so cool. I actually take my leftover food to the composting guy at the farmer's market on Saturdays. What are you guys working on? Yeah, you have to call public information on Monday and then they can request the information from us. Okay. Day 25. I call Pub Ed and I explain my situation to two, I'm sure, underpaid public servants. The first woman says, you need to talk to Kathy, hold on. I listen to what's apparently an endless loop of earth, wind and fire September. Do you remember the 21st night of September? Love was changing the minds of pretenders. You probably didn't know those were the lyrics, did you? I do because I hear the song begin and end again and and begin again and then Kathy picks up and says you need to send an email hold on well chasing the clouds away and then a man picks up hello uh hi um are you meaning to talk to me or did you pick up on accident oh yeah I think I did pick up the wrong line can I help you with something Oh, oh my gosh, yes. Um, my name's Deb. Um, I'm writing a show and I want to follow a bottle, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, I can help you with that. Can you hold on? Yeah, great. And then Kathy comes back, freaking stonewalls me. All right, here's the email address. Oh, actually, a man just picked up and he's going to help me. The deputy commissioner picked up. Yeah, so you can just put me back on hold. He told me to tell you to send an email. Oh. Um, can you at least tell me his name? Because he really sounded like he wanted to help. Vito Terso. V-I-T-O. Yeah, I got it. Vito's my dad's name. Wait a minute. Hold the phone. My name is Deborah Castellano. My father's name is Vito Castellano, or as my mom likes to say, Vito Castellano. You know who Paul Castellano is? He was a Staten Island Sicilian who got whacked outside of a steakhouse in Midtown, Midtown in the 80s by John Gotti's boys because Gotti didn't like the way Castellano was running things. Okay, Staten Island, Sicilians, waste management, I'm just saying. Day 33, it is a 
gorgeous day for the Staten Island Ferry. And that is where I am because I'm going to find my people and they're going to help me find out why no one wants to talk to me about my plastic bottle. I fired up a server somewhere and Googled Castellano Staten Island and come across a little music shop owned by one John Castellano. And since I sing a little and play a little ukulele, I decide that's where I'm starting. As I board the ferry with my bike, I take it as a good omen when I pass someone I know, my friend Paulina's husband, who it turns out is a ship's mate on the ferry. I don't see him again after that, but before we dock, I talk to a janitor named Dave. You got to take your bike off with you. Next ferry back leaves at five o'clock. Oh, I'm not taking the next ferry. I'm actually going to Staten Island. I'm going to a store called Castellano's House of Music. Oh, okay. You live on Staten Island? Yeah. You know any Castellanos? Nah. Isn't that a mob name? You related? Uh, I don't know, maybe. That's what I'm going to find out. You guys, Staten Island is way bigger than I thought. And I finally get to Castellano's House of Music, five minutes before they close. There are two ukuleles and a stand on the counter, so it looks promising, but John Castellano isn't there. His nephew, Phil, is. Can I help you? Yeah, hi, are you a Castellano? Why, are we in trouble? I tell him who I am and why I'm there, but he wants to close up, so he tells me to call his Uncle John and gives me a card. And I give him my card, and then it's back onto the ferry, where this time I chat for a few minutes with my friend Paulina's husband, the ship's mate. And then I say, well, I'm gonna go outside and catch the sunset. You wanna go higher? Um, sure. And he leads the way into a chained off area, through a locked door, up some dark stairs and into the rear engine control room. There, there are two of them, one at each end of the ferry, like the subway. And this one's empty right now. Then we go out a door, and onto the top deck of the Staten Island Ferry. It is spectacular. The wind whips through my hair. The sky is a bright magenta and deep orange over the water. And we ride by the Statue of Liberty with her torch. It's so beautiful. But when she says, give me the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, I don't think she's talking about disposable diapers. And I think to myself, if I can just have some tiny positive impact, if my positive impact can just slightly outweigh my negative impact, then my life would mean something. And this is why we don't do anything. Because we don't know what to do. That's the end of excerpt two. That's wonderful. I, I, I thank you so much. I love the, the piece and I love your humor. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I can't seem to write anything serious. I don't know why. <laughs> and I can't seem to write anything funny. It turns out serious. So. <laughs> um, we have lots to talk about, but it's just the top of the hour. And I want to take a quick moment to remind the audience that posted in the chat is the link to the tip jar, of course. Um, your tax deductible support is indeed needed and, and really appreciated to keep the Marsh Stream platform open to our communities during this time. And um, also, we encourage comments and questions from the audience. And I'm going to ask um, Kristen and Brianna to help me keep an eye on that because uh, sometimes they, they pass me by. But I know that um, the Citizen Deb would love your questions. I would. Uh, for the audience talk back. So, so we'll all keep an eye on that. And, um, and the chat was closed during performance, but it's open now. Um, and uh, let's see what we have in there right now. Is there any other... We had a couple comments of suggestions um, from Sean and uh, Susan. Oh, Sean, I see, says rigid plastic is recyclable in San Francisco. Black pl plastic chickens come in. So that's great to know because um, I uh, had attended a presentation at the Ecology Center in Berkeley and, and he said it wasn't recycled. So um, that's really good to know. And San Francisco is way ahead of everybody. <laughs> California, where I'm from. I'm from California. Yeah. San Francisco's good. And thanks, Kristen. Susan Strolls um, said, oops, that just, 
Um, get your mom some beeswax cloth to replace the saran wrap stuff. I, yeah, I have one of those. I want to get, they actually have these silicone things I've seen at like home goods and stuff that are, that come in different sizes and they're really fantastic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. They just cut, cause then you, you don't, you know, you've got something in a bowl and you don't want to put it ice. I'm always like, put it in a Tupperware, but you just want to, so these things just slide over it and then you wash them really easily. And yes. That's great. And Annette says, it kills me anytime I get a large plastic container that's number six is my building doesn't recycle it. Yeah, are there is are there recycling more than number ones and number twos? Um, well, where I live now, I live in a little village in upstate New York in the Hudson Valley, and they take numbers one, two, and five, which is really common. Basically, that's plastic, you know, like water bottles and laundry, plastic laundry bottles, and then um, uh, I'm blanking, but um, you know, yeah, one, two, and five, um, but. And when she says her building, I'm sure that she just typed that by accident, but it's that it's, you know, obviously it's not the building it's, it's, um, you know, and, and it's a lot of this is still picked up. Like in my village, I met the mayor, it's a tiny village. And um, I said, you know, he said, we have a recycling problem. And I said, oh, is it because China's not taking our recycling? And he said, yeah. And he said, it's good that you're taking yours to the waste station. Cause I, I kind of like to go to the waste station. I talk to the guys and everything. And, um, and he said, yeah, the people with curbside, it's all just going into landfill. And I said, why are they still picking it up? Is it like to keep people in the habit? And he's like, we just haven't figured out what to do yet. So, That's you know, I'm trying to buy bulk and you know, wh whatever I can. But the thing is, I'm like, you know, a, 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 like I'm an affluent yuppie asshole, sorry. Um, you know, I can do that. And, and a lot of people, you know, they're just, they're just gonna buy, you know, like there's tuna, right? There's at the dollar store, there's a dollar, of, you know, a can of Starkist for a dollar. And then at the, you know, at the other store, there's like the $6 Italian tuna and olive oil. People, people do what they can afford. And that's why we have to really speak up. Well, yeah, I think the first thing is we really want to try to reduce the plastic in the first place. Exactly. And, you know, maybe look at the numbers that you have. And um, someone um, is saying here, Sandy is saying, I hate to be a Deb Donner as opposed to Citizen Deb, but silicone isn't recyclable and neither is black plastic anywhere no, no. or any other was, plastic. Although no, we just heard from yeah. someone that it is recycled in San Francisco. So that's something we should look into. Well, this, yeah, the silicone I, I use because it's reusable. I try not to use single use plastic, but the silicone I can, I use over and over and over again. It just always stays. So that's why I use it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Certain yeah. plastics break down and have a shorter uh, uh, shelf life. And um, um, Robin asks, what is happening to the effort to get manufacturers to be responsible of recycling their products, which you were talking about the importance of getting top down uh, buy-in from this. You know, until we have regulations, which uh, have been undone at great speed in the last four years. Um, they just do what they want. Uh, so we'll we'll get these regulations back and you know have somebody who understands that climate change is real and that it's important and who assigns you know a special envoy to climate change. Biden. Um, a, 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 named John Kerry is that position. And, um, you know, gets the EPA back on board. The EPA, um, you know, was run like the first three years of the last administration by a, you know, a, a crony. And so- Oh, it was run for money. a while by an oil man, so. Yeah, it's about, it's just, it's about money and, um, and, you know, for all of us, I mean, I don't want to okay. sound snobby like I, I i'm like it's the pandemic like things are rough right now with even with with exactly. me with a lot of a lot of people but um but i mean the whole you know corporations what can i what can i say right, we have to right. really we've fought, got to fight the good fight and we we do we can we do that we do mm -hmm. have impact and you know i have a lot of hope now that's great to hear um there was a comment here um what um 
What is happening to the effort to get manufacturers to be, oh no, we did, we did that one already, I'm sorry. It, I've, um, Kristen um, said, I've noticed that with COVID there is protective plastic on everything. So the pandemic has deprioritized plastic reduction, which really is true when you think about gloves, you know, everyone's wearing plastic gloves and, and uh, you know, the, yeah. everything is single servings and-, and Yeah, it, I know, it's, it's rough, it's really, really hard. hard Oil Luckily, I'm in quarantine yeah. right now, so I don't, I don't go anywhere and see it. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, Linda says, "Great topic. I'm always separating stuff out of the waste bins at my apartment building. My neighbors seem clueless that styrofoam is trash, not recycling, etc. Don't get me started on styrofoam," she says. Yeah, that's a thing we just totally want to not use. Styrofoam. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's a communications thing where I where I'm yeah, working on reaching people and yeah, and I think a lot of food places now are going to um, more sustainable uh, food wrapping. Uh, at you least know what? Where you we know, live. Yeah, you know why they do that? Because they're it's the law. Yeah, businesses oh. they do that. You know, businesses change their their ways when they have to when there's a regulation. Mm -hmm. um, and, or if there's a, a monetary incentive, which is understandable, they're a business. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, most people don't do that with goodness of their heart. They do it because it's required. Right, and right. Well, thing. we got to keep working on those. On those we goals. do, yeah. Eric says, like I said, Hi, California Deb. Trailblazer. <laughs> Eric says, Hi, Deb, what's your solution to solve the big plastic island in the middle of the Pacific? Um, yeah, since you left the city, waste management at River West has gone downhill. You need to come back, <laughs> says Eric. Ah, so a friend of yours. And the thing is, he's talking about the Pacific gyre, but we have five or six gyres in, in, in the oceans in the world, the big yeah. in the Pacific, two in that's, the Pacific, I believe. I know. That's the, that's the biggie, the big mother. But yeah, yeah. And so uh, there's a, there's a young engineer. That. I know a young engineer had devised a system to try to, um, you know, get the plastic together so that they could actually round it up because most of it is below the surface and it's very hard to mm -hmm. see. But um, mm -hmm. there's actually some work being done on that, which is very positive. So, Thank goodness. Yeah. 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 Thank goodness. Uh, Sandy actually again says things. silicone eventually is discarded and does not decompose and is partially made with fossil fuels. So something that's good information. And mm -hmm. Holly says, I worked with two hotels here in Toronto and sadly all of the plastic wrap through the dry cleaning ended up in the trash. They also did the same thing with the toilet paper that Deb talked about, but thankfully all the half used rolls were brought down to the staff washroom. So they were used fully. Oh. You know, I wanted to talk about that for a minute because I, when you were doing the piece, I looked it up real quick worldwide, the equivalent of almost 270,000 trees is either flushed or dumped in landfills every day. Don't scare people, Gail. You're <laughs> going to make them run away. Well, one thing that I always say is single ply. You know, do we need the triple single ply? ply? <laughs> really, it's really hurting. It, it's an actual issue and it's really clogging up our you know, entire you know, system. You know, the thing is, the thing is, though, I, this is something from my book. Do you remember how we do it on time? I should get back to the, the rest of it, but but you know, d some of you out there either have remember or just know about the crying Indian commercial, you know, like the crying the Indians in the canoe. It's this is from the '70s, and he, you know, rose up to a. He ends up on the side of a freeway, and people are throwing trash at his feet, and he look, you know, has the little thing, and it says. Um, what is it people people cause pollution people can stop pollution keep america beautiful and you know who made that the polluters the plastic the, the packaging companies oh yeah like it's our fault yeah <laughs> yeah and, and that's and that's and all of a sudden it, things shifted because at that point like people were the epa had just started and everybody was you know rah rah and let's you know the whole environment the first earth day was that year and they were like no 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 it's not we got to make we got to make them, we got to take it off of us and make them think it's, they're responsible. Now, of course, I'm going to take responsible for my, you know, responsibility for my own actions and my own behaviors, but I also have to work on, you know, it's like the LED lights, like I am saving money, but I mean, ultimately there's a way bigger fish to fry. I have to do both. So. 
just, you know, yeah. Absolutely. And there, there are some other comments, but let's do, you're working on a book, right? I am. So um, I know you have an excerpt for us, but let, let's, let's listen to that and then we can take some more um, audience questions and comments. Okay, cool. So and your book title is? I, I suck at titles. If anybody has ideas. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, I've got an agent and she's, we're working on the, the proposal and the, you know, all the same, we're going, you know, through the samples and stuff, but it's like title TBA. Um, yeah, she's actually, that's... I was thinking like how to save the planet and she's actually the one who came up with the subtitle or should we? Um, <laughs> so we'll see what the title is. So yeah, this is, this is just a, this is a little excerpt from partly from the introduction and then a little from the first chapter. I'm going to drink a sip of tea. And P.S. I am so psyched that people from my old building in the city are here. So sweet. Okay. The climate crisis actually upsets me so much that I kind of had a mental breakdown over it. This literal dark night of the soul could have been brought on by so many things, but I think it was that fateful night in the way back times when Hillary lost the presidential election. It was after midnight and my badly shaken friends had taken their unopened champagne and headed slowly home. Without turning on the kitchen light, I cleaned up the chili bowls and the used Kleenex. Then, still in the dark, I got on my computer and I fired up the Google and put my fingers on the keyboard. I was searching for something, but I didn't entirely know what. So I laid my head down on the desk and I just breathed. Then I looked back up at the screen and I quietly typed the word environment. And for some reason, Columbia with a U. And up popped a certificate program in conservation and environmental sustainability at Columbia University's Earth Institute. You guys asked me how cool I thought I was when I got my student ID, <laughs> having gone to some crap college in Southern California for undergrad. On my first day of class, I walked up those big stone steps on campus and paused to take in the sheer beauty of an Ivy League college with the sun shining on the stone and brick facades. It was gorgeous. And then I spazzed out and spilled my Starbucks all over the steps. And that's what I get for drinking it out of a single use cup with a plastic lid. But the program itself was fantastic. And then I decided to write a book because I know you. You also put your wine bottles and takeout containers and Amazon boxes into the alleged recycling bins. But now maybe you've heard China's not taking our refuse anymore. And who can blame them? You wonder, is this recyclable? Is that? And how much is a ton of CO2 anyway, compared to say a queen size bed? I'm not even sure how big an acre is. And now that you mention it, how can something in gas form weigh anything? In fact, you probably have many questions. Is natural gas natural? What does that even mean? Are wind turbines bird death traps? Should I buy property in Iceland for when it warms up there? Am I a jerk if I'm not vegan? Is there anything I can actually do besides post save the earth memes on social media? And the answers to those are, um, no, for sure. It's a sliding scale and you can do lots of things. But I find it's really helpful and entertaining to start the beginning of everything. Chapter one, in the beginning, there was Darwin, at least as far as I'm concerned. I'm not so much a God person, although Darwin actually was, despite his impious discoveries. Equally religious was Robert Fitzroy, captain of the HMS Beagle, the ship on which young Darwin performed the duties of naturalist for five years as they sailed around the Southern hemisphere. In fact, after Darwin wrote and eventually published The Origin of Species, the religiously faithful Captain Fitzroy was so mortified that in challenging Darwin's heretical theories during their voyage, they'd actually encourage them. He went into his bathroom and slit his own throat. To be fair, religions and their doctrines did give people an excuse 
to bathe once a week and meet up for the latest gossip over badly percolated coffee and provided a framework for some ground rules around things like stealing your neighbor's cow and making time with his wife. Apparently dungeons weren't scary enough. They had to bust out eternal damnation to keep folks in line. People have often used God or whatever deity is handy as an excuse to fight one another, whether it be clubbing each other to death on a muddy field or speed confirming Supreme Court justices. But in truth, animals of which kingdom we are a part have been fighting over Earth's limited resources since life began. Like land, call it territory or call it real estate, but we'll take it, thank you very much, and whatever's on it or in it. Or we'll just take what we want from someone else's land, including water, I'm looking at you, Nestle, or trees, and leave our mess behind for others to clean up, which is basically how strip mining and oil drilling and fracking work. If you wanna be picky, there are also groups known as social collectives, which will violently protect their members from the Aryan Brotherhood in 1930s Germany, to the first MS-13 gangs in LA in the 80s, to modern MAGAs, but we usually fight over resources. Food was the first one. Before we had language or even walked upright, we fought over food. There's a chapter later on food since it's also the original human caused climate changer. Fuel followed soon after, whether it was wood for fire, whale fat for lanterns or fossil fuel for electric wine openers and fingernail dryers. We'll talk more about fuel in the energy chapter. Before the American Revolution and the invention of steel, the early colonists rebelled against the King of England's helping himself to our largest and oldest white pines because the big ships with the tallest single tree masts won the wars. And Great Britain had already chopped down most of its old growth forest by then. If you haven't heard of Ebenezer Mudgett and the colonial pine tree riot of 1772, well, you can take your Boston Tea Party, which wouldn't happen for another year, and suck it. In addition to food, water, fuel, lumber, and apparently tea, people also really liked sparkly metals and stones that showed how rich and powerful they were, as if they were part of the population, or if they were part of a population that was allowed to be rich and powerful. The money chapter is a regular hoop nanny. And if you ask yourself where all of those things come from, and you put down your beer or whatever beverage you're drinking right now and you put on your thinking cap, it might occur to you that they all come from one place, one big round dirt and water covered place that's now crawling with humans, 7.8 billion humans. Did you catch it when I mentioned that food was the original caused, the original human caused climate changer? You know how the news is always saying things like hottest year on record and too many hurricanes to name and telling us that we didn't mess up the environment bigly until the industrial revolution and acting like we pretty much have to reinvent the wheel and throw baby birds into windmills to get ourselves out of this mess. If I hear the phrase these unprecedented times once more, I'm going to flip a lid because these times is precedented. Anyway, let's go back to the way beginning because A, I think it's cool, and B, because it really knocks down all barriers between people, animals, cantaloupes, mosquitoes, slime mold. This is gonna explain a lot because we're all connected. All life is from the natural recycling of organic matter. Everything is really. Our sun was made out of an old recycled star. The earth was made out of rocks and organic metals that were scattered around our galaxy, which we call the Milky Way, because that's how we see the billions of neighboring solar systems that stretch on so far that they blur into a soft white stripe against the night sky. Everything is made of everything else. And there's a finite amount of it all, at least in the places we can reach. Keep that in mind as we proceed as well as the myth of frontier culture and unlimited expansion. You think a year of lockdown is hard? Imagine life in a space pod. There's not enough Netflix. And I will end this excerpt with uh, two quotes. 
which I really like. Uh, one is from Charles Darwin. Um, this is the very last line in the end of Origin of Species. And I guess you would say it, in, it with an English accent. So, uh, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. And the second one is from Mike Pence. <clears throat> I don't know that this is a resolved issue in science today. Thank you. <laughs> Mike Pence, the quote, oh my goodness. Well, we're headed in a, in a, in a new direction. So um, we have great hope right now for all that. Yeah. That's marvelous, uh, Deb. You, you, you are covering a vast amount of information there. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's 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 kind of like Citizen Deb explains the environment. Like every chapter has a, a you know a different subject, like waste, water, food, people, money, air, um, development, and so it just kind of breaks everything down so that people can really understand what we're doing, like what's happening, what's not happening, why do we need to do it? And it's just, it's so complex. You know, I'm super nerdy. I'm like, a, I call myself an enviro viral nerd because I'm such a dork about all this stuff. But I mean, so I want to just make it and put it in a really fun to read, but, uh, you know, informative piece that hopefully people will, you know, help people fight the good fight. Absolutely. We have a comment in the chat that says, Environment America has a campaign to hold Whole Foods accountable for their lack of commitment to improving recycled content in their packaging, etc. Other big companies are doing much better. So maybe consumer pressure on large companies can help. Oh, 100%. Oh, yes. 100%. And, and that asks, what advice do you have for those of us trying to teach and reach neighbors, colleagues who could care less? Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard. What I just, I find the best thing is to model the model, the behavior. Like for example, I was, I was vegan for a couple of years. Now I'm, I'm kind of mostly vegan, but, um, but definitely not entirely, but I was very, a very um, dedicated vegan for like two and a half years. And I never, uh, and the only reason I was, was because, uh, cause I have a, one of my best friends has been vegan for like 25 years or something, but for some reason, I just, it didn't seem appealing until another friend of mine, he just made it look really fun. Like he was belonged to a vegan jogging group and a la 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 la. And so I tried it. That's a, you know, that's, just, that's just a whole story about that on my blog. But, um, when I would eat with people, when I would go out to meals, when we used to do that and you know, I would order vegan and, and the friends would just ask me, but I never said you should do it. I, I mean, most vegans really don't, I don't think, but I mean, I just modeled it and I talked about how I really loved eating these new things. Like, mm -hmm. like it wasn't about giving up. It wasn't, oh my gosh, it's getting late, isn't it? I'll wrap it up. But you know, like I've had lobster and, and foie gras and oysters and everything but this was like I'm going to explore something different and it opened up this whole new thing and like five different friends went vegan during that time mm -hmm. and I think it's wow. just because they saw what well, I, you know yeah you know I think that there's, there's such a big issue with that and it's a really good one to bring up because um the 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 idea of vegan is to not use animal products because the animals are so used and abused in mass production and also the problems we have with beef um, just with the the um, adding to climate change don't we you know yeah, you it's, mentioned it's something really earlier about food adding to climate change did you have a specific yeah. point on that briefly? well just that it i mean no the ag agriculture uh, animal agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to greenhouse gases and okay. um you know i did it originally because i didn't want to you know have bad things happen to baby chicks. And then I realized it's, it's also really good for my health and it's really good for the environment. So it was like a triple sure. wins. Um, we have I'm, a lot of comments in here <laughs> that I'm afraid I'm not going to get to them all, but let me just try to um, go through quickly. Um, trash bins. Um, let's see. Yeah. A lot of people don't know um, about it, it. We need more, um, uh, education for people about recycling again and you know what um, i'm gonna stop i'm gonna stop you there because it's really not about recycling it's about reducing you know yes, there's that reducing. reduce 
reduce, reuse, reuse recycle. recycle. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I would yeah. say, don't, I mean, do recycle, but I, let, put, put that aside, like focus on the reducing and focus mm -hmm. on reusing and and some um, buildings, somebody comments that some p buildings are using reused, you know, um, bamboo toilet paper, someone says, can you <laughs> single use yeah. water bottles? Ha ha. There's a bill yeah. used in the house to make plastic distributors responsible for the plastic. Um, Yay. I don't know yes. if that's, See, that's in what health. I'm talking about. Yeah, okay, that's what we need. That's what we need. We Contact need your representatives yeah. to get them on board. Yeah, um, there's links here. It, um, your links. I do want to remind people about your blog on um, waste management. The blog, um, the oh, link yeah. for Cit Citizen Deb is in the chat. Yeah, citizendeb.com. Okay. Easy term. And someone says, you are amazing, so funny and thought provoking, the best way oh. to communicate. Thanks for talking about these tough issues in a totally reliable way. Bravo. So I think Aww. that's a beautiful way to um, end our show. Do you have any parting comments to make, Deb? Oh, probably so many, but, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, we got we, we a lot of work ahead of us and it's not easy. It's not easy for anybody. I don't want to make anybody the bad guy. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like good guy, bad guy. It's like, we're all just trying to do our best and, and learn about these things and pay the rent. And, you know, so we need help. We need help from our, our government, you know, what could I say? Our, our leaders are, you know, the people that are in charge of, of laws and things like that. And we need to do what we can and put the pressure on companies and, and reduce, just reduce and, you know, try not Absolutely. buying something reduce reuse recycle and do call your you know you can let your stores know and, really, manufacturers know and you can let your representatives know um, it, works. Because it makes a difference calls yeah. make a difference emails make a difference and especially when you have sometimes there's mass um you know emails that you that you sign up for but if you change the wording a little bit you know that that kind of stands out so yeah, um, think about that and, and keep following up. And thank you for your good work. I really look forward to the book. And um, we'll we'll talk about that more um, in the future when when it comes out. So with Sweet. that, thank you. I'd like to thank um, Citizen Deb Castellano um, and to Marstream producers, Christian Brianna, Artistic Director Stephanie Wiseman, and always to our Zoom and YouTube audiences. Um, I do uh, want to let you know that next week we're going to feature the Health Story Collaborative with Dr. Annie Brewster and storyteller Carolyn Wright. Um, Annie is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and a practicing internist at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. She is also a patient diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2001, and she's been collecting and sharing patient stories since 2010. She founded the nonprofit Health Story Collaborative, committed to empowering patients and their loved ones, building community, strengthening patient provider connections, and ultimately transforming healthcare through storytelling. So we not only will have Dr. Brewster with us, but one of the storytellers, Carolyn Wright, will be with us um, sharing her story. So I hope you'll all join us next week for that. And um, with that, I turn it back to you, Kristen. Thank you so much, Gail, and thanks, Deb, and thanks to our audience here on the Zoom and in the YouTube. Please join us uh, the rest of the week and the weekend uh, for other Marstream programs, and we'll see you next week for a special uh, health collaborative um, episode on Solo Arts Heal. Thanks a lot, and uh, good night, everybody. How do I describe my journey with me? Your mother, who takes care of you, who takes you to the doctor when you're sick. Your mother. Good morning, New York. Buenos dias. It's me. What's up? We went out for lunch at a sushi place where she tried sushi for the first time and she liked it. I see that change can happen. I know things can shift and change for good. I am dizzily dazzled. 
with stars in my eyes. The same level as I broke my neck. But he's not getting the same return of function I am. And I don't want any of your smart Alec sex talk that I usually get when I get over. This is beyond the marsh because what you're doing is planting beautiful seeds for artists to grow.